some breaking news now. Human trials for a COVID-19 vaccine will begin today with a group of volunteers being given the treatment at the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne. Details are being unveiled at a media conference. We're going to take you straight there. Today's press conference is a virtual one. Appropriate social distancing is being observed and a single ABC camera crew is in the room for this press conference, sharing to all media here and abroad via a live feed. Further assets are also available to the media via dedicated links as shared with the media via embargoed release. This embargoed release invited media to submit questions via our online portal ahead of today's press conference. And these questions will be asked at the appropriate time by ABC reporter Elias Kluwer at the conclusion of the speeches. We are fortunate to have with us today three speakers to officially launch this Novavax vaccine here in Melbourne. In the room, we have from the Victorian Government, the Honourable Frank McGuire, Parliamentary Secretary for Medical Research. We also have Dr Paul Griffin, Infectious Diseases Physician and Microbiologist from Nucleus Network. And via live online feed from Maryland in the US, we have Dr Gregory Glenn, President of R&D of Novavax. I'll introduce each of these speakers individually with questions held until the conclusion of the third speaker. So to commence proceedings, I introduce our first speaker, the Honourable Frank McGuire from the Victorian Government. Frank is a Member of Parliament and Victoria's first Parliamentary Secretary for Medical Research. Frank called for Australia to partner US President Barack Obama's cancer moonshot advocacy, leading to then Vice President Joe Biden's visit to Melbourne in 2016 for the opening of the Billion Dollar Victorian Comprehensive Cancer Centre. Frank also launched the Science, Medical, Research and Technology Panel in 2016, designed to leverage investment and partnerships to transfer discoveries from benchtop to business and capitalise on Australia's emerging $20 billion medical research future fund. I now hand the microphone over to Minister Maguire. Vaccines are one of humanity's defining discoveries. Such elegant science saves lives and livelihoods. The world craves a vaccine against a new virus that has grown into a pandemic monster. COVID-19 has infected more than 5 million people worldwide and placed the global economy on life support. Today, we launched the first human trials in the Southern Hemisphere in the search for a vaccine against the coronavirus. Proving how we are all in this together, an American company has come to Victoria, the beating heart of Australia's internationally acclaimed medical research, to collaborate with Melbourne's Alfred Hospital and Burnett Institute. Collaboration is critical in the quest to discover a vaccine against the worst pandemic in more than a century. There are no certainties against this mysterious virus that is proving more virulent and fatal than the flu. Our hope is that collaboration, particularly internationally, advances discoveries and shortens the odds of a breakthrough. Australia and America have already established a unity ticket for the cancer moonshot. When President Barack Obama challenged America to be the country that cures cancers, I proposed Australia should offer to partner. Harking back to the original moonshot, American exceptionalism put Neil Armstrong on the moon in 1969, and Australian ingenuity transmitted that iconic vision internationally through our satellite dish at Honeysuckle Creek outside Canberra. This collaboration was forged not in war, but in the sea of tranquility through science. The call to internationalise the cancer moonshot has led to numerous countries joining the quest, which increases our chances of life-changing and life-saving discoveries. It also forged a unity ticket between Australia and the administrations of President Barack Obama and President Donald J. Trump. We don't know whether today's launch will deliver one small step or a giant leap in discovering a vaccine for the coronavirus. We do know it will advance our knowledge. For this cause, it is in Australia's DNA to have a go. On behalf of the Victorian Government, we wish you every success Stay strong, stay well, good luck. <coughs> Thank you, Minister Maguire. Our second speaker is Dr Gregory Glenn, the President of Research and Development at Novavax. 
Dr Glenn leads Novavax's discovery, clinical and regulatory teams. His responsibilities include the leadership of the NVX COV2373 program, a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine for COVID-19, the nanoflu program, an adjuvanted recombinant seasonal influenza vaccine, the RSV programs, including maternal immunisation, an RSVF vaccine for older and high-risk adults and other emerging infectious disease vaccines. He has spent 28 years in the design and development of vaccines, vaccine delivery and adjuvants. I'll now hand the microphone over to Dr Glenn, who joins us online from Novavax HQ in Maryland, USA. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for those remarks. We appreciate uh, <clears throat> personally the remarks that the Honorable Frank McGuire made and uh, you know how he represents a uh, you know government willing to work together. We're, we're certainly wanting to collaborate internationally, and this is really a, a, a momentous day. I want to thank the people of Australia for hosting this trial in the most really significant uh, pandemic of our uh, times, certainly one of the most historic events ever. And uh, we're, we're extremely thankful for the collaboration that we have here uh, in, in Australia. I want to thank our my colleagues uh, we've been working tire tirelessly on making the vaccine, so this is a very big day for us to begin the, the clinical testing uh, portion of this, and the Nucleus Network, of course, our colleagues there, uh, for CEPI, uh, who has also enabled us to, to move forward. And then most importantly, we want to thank the volunteers who are stepping forward for the benefit of, of millions of, of people around the globe. And I sincerely believe we have a vaccine that is going to be very good, can be licensed and address this uh, this problem. So we're a Maryland company where that means we're on the East Coast. We're near Washington, D.C. Um, our goal is to develop next generation vaccines. We really have a proprietary uh, uh, technology that is uh, very advanced, uh, allows us to generate vaccines. And, and I appreciate, again, the remarks made earlier about the importance of vaccines. I'm a pediatrician by training. Vaccines are really miracles. They uh, have a great uh, way of, of, of protecting uh, the population against these severe diseases. And now, again, I'm very optimistic that this could be done, done here. Our technology is advanced. Uh, we've just recently completed what's called the phase three trial, which is one of the last stages of testing for a flu, a better flu vaccine. And so we bring to the table a very good technology, a novel way of making vaccines. Uh, it's mature, and we're excited that uh, this can be tested here in Australia. We have done this before. Uh, our group, because we deal with infectious diseases, constantly monitors the environment for new viruses. Uh, of course, that's part of the mission with flu. So we've made a vaccine, a novel vaccine for MERS, Middle East Respiratory Sy Syndrome, SARS-1, if you will, Ebola, uh, several of the pandemics, and this really is our time, I think, as a company to, to stand up and, and address this uh, large imminent need. As we all know, it's a severe disease, it's paralyzed the world. Uh, we have, uh, you know, it's a situation where people ex are extremely ill from this, so even the mortality doesn't tell the whole tale. The people that are uh, contract the disease can spend long time uh, uh, periods in the ICU and in medical care, uh, debilitated, so we're very eager to see a vaccine uh, that, that can alleviate the symptoms and, and prevent severe illness. So um, our vaccine, uh, we began to work on this. As I mentioned, we watched the world. We saw this, uh, this strange cluster of pneumonias arising in China in late January. We began to work on a vaccine, and um, we've, we've really made great progress. We made about 30 different constructs. We evaluated them for their stability, for their immunogenicity, uh, for the, the, the ability for us to scale this up in a big way. And we selected one candidate who has the, has the uh, very fancy name that you heard, 2373. Uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a great vaccine. What, why is it such a good vaccine? I think what we're bringing to the table is a very strong immunogenic vaccine. It gives you functional responses. We've recently seen in our animal testing uh, very strong, what we call neutralizing antibodies, which should be protective uh, when they're induced in, in humans. So 
with a mature technology. And we leave that media conference there, Representative from Novavax. Uh, the first human trials in the Southern Hemisphere getting underway in the search for that, that global search, Lisa, for the elusive, the much needed coronavirus vaccine. Let's bring in now uh, Norman Swan, Dr. Norman Swan, the presenter of the RN's Health Report. Uh, Norman, good morning. What do you know about this? Uh, this is one of the many, you know, over 100 vaccines under development. Um, this is called a recombinant protein vaccine. And what, there, there are various strategies, just give me a moment to explain the various strategies for vaccines mm -hmm. in COVID-19. Um, the more you use of the virus, the, the more likely you are to get a decent antibody response. And they're focusing on these spike proteins. So you, everybody knows what the spikes look like because they've seen a picture of the coronavirus with all the spikes around it. The spike is how it gets into cells. So what they've done is manufactured a synthetic f protein which relates to this spike and hope that the that, that generates the antibodies that uh, the company representative there was talking about that will attack that that spike and stop it getting into cells. So that's one version. That's one type of, uh, of of vaccine. Another is using bigger chunks of the virus. Uh, another another strategy is attaching the uh, what's going to cause the antibody response to another virus. That's the Oxford University, the Oxford vaccine, where you're actually using a virus to generate a response. And then there's another one, which is a little parcel of genetic material which goes into the cell to tell the cell to produce antibodies. So those are roughly the, the, the kinds of, um, of, of uh, techniques that have been used, including using the whole virus itself in a killed or uh, semi-live form. So there's lots of ways of doing it, and this is one which they hope will work. Uh, Norman, I just did a quick little bit of scanning of the release and of course all of that was embargoed. We couldn't even tell people that that press conference was going to be taking place. So under very secret circumstances, 130 people ages 18 to 59 with hopefully some results by July 2020. But of course we have to be cautious with everything. You've got some thoughts as well in regards to the use of masks at the moment because we were uh, speaking earlier about Joe Biden being seen out today for the first time wearing a, a dark mask. It's Memorial Day, but I'm seeing more and more people using them around the place in Australia. Well, it's a very public spirited thing to be wearing masks because they probably don't protect you if you're wearing the mask, but they protect other people. So the idea in masks, the evidence base is not huge, but it, it does suggest that you can cut down the spread of virus by about 60 percent, perhaps even more because you're, if asymptomatic people are wearing the mask. So if, uh, now, we probably don't have enough virus in the community to really merit what Singapore or New York's done, that everybody going outside should wear a mask. But um, I, I, my belief is, and I'll talk, come to this type of mask in a moment, is that if you want to speed up access to public transport as you open up schools in particular and offices, masks may well be a way of getting around that. So if you want to get on a tram, you want to get on a train or a bus, uh, you have to wear a mask. And, uh, and the question, uh, that could well speed up and allow closer packing um, and, and less social distancing on those environments because public transport is a bit neutered if you've only got, um, if you've got only 12 people to a carriage or 20 people to a carriage. Um, let me go to the type of mask because that's really important. You see a lot of you see people spending a lot of money on N95 masks mm. with a little valve in front. They can make things worse, actually. They're really good for bushfires and inhaling, part, you know, getting rid of particulates. They're good in healthcare settings because they do protect um, healthcare workers because they filter the virus in. But look at that picture. There's no um, there's no exit. There's no vi no valve filtering on the way out. So when you breathe out, you get this stream of your, of your exhalation coming through. And if you're carrying the virus, it's shooting out of the N95 mask, if that's the one that you get. So these N95 masks could actually make it worse if what we're doing is a public health measure. What you, in fact, what the fire brigade in San Francisco are doing is they've been assigned those N95 masks. They're wearing a surgical mask over the N N95 mask to stop this exhalation. So um, really, in, in truth, what you want to do is, is cover your face with thick material, um, ideally a surgical mask if you can get one. We, I think we haven't got a problem at the moment with um, uh, certain supplies to hospitals, um, but you know, e even a material like denim or anything that doesn't get wet too quickly 
um, and that, uh, that you can either discard or wash would be effective to some extent. Uh, now, finally, Norman, uh, one of the, the many, many reasons I like listening to the Corona Cars podcast, uh, other than your expert advice, is hearing all of the uh, questions from people right around Australia asked of you. And one of the most popular ones, one of the most recent ones, is one a lot of our viewers have been asking. When will it be safe to hug parents and grandparents again? This is, a, this is a conversation that you really need to have as a family. Um, and and, and I, th I think we talked about this last week, and giving autonomy to older people to make the decision for themselves. Um, for example, so I think if there's any cold or flu in the family, any symptoms, you've got to get tested and you don't actually hug and you maintain social distance. But if everybody's well, um, then it's really up to the, uh, the, the older people in the family to decide what, the, what risk they're prepared to take with their loved ones um, rather than us imposing it on them. This is not so much about the spread of the virus as protecting their health and well-being. And I don't think we should be dictating to them. I think um, who are we to deny uh, a hug um, in an environment where we've got very low levels of virus? I think it's a, a family conversation. Very good point. And a virtual hug to you from us here at News Breakfast, Norman. <laughs> I always welcome the hug for you and Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Thanks, you very Norman. much. See you soon.